Good afternoon on a chilly afternoon in St. Louis. Welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gilla, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School here at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, for those of you joining us on Zoom, you likely know this about the webinar format, but we can't see or hear the audience and we can't call on raised hands. But you are a vital part of this experience, vital part of this program. The chat is how we would love to have your questions and comments throughout the program. I am joined by Cynthia Williams, the Brown School's Assistant Dean for Community Partnerships. She's going to help moderate the chat and also represent your voice as we move to the Q&A portion. And I'm also joined by my colleague, Sarah Birch, the Associate Director of Admissions and Recruitment. Sarah, would you like to say a few words before we get started? And, and welcome, everyone. I want to give a particular welcome to those among you our prospective students. As Janet shared, I have the privilege of being an Associate Director of Admissions and Recruitment for the Brown School and very excited about this new series that we launched with Open Classroom this spring called Curriculum Showcase. Um, really what we're hoping that uh, you're able to gain from this series and from our talk today is a sense of, of what it's like to be in a Brown School classroom. Um, today's will feature what it's like to be in a classroom with, with Dr. Reyes, uh, and he'll introduce himself here soon. Um, we do have a number of wonderful programs coming up throughout the rest of the spring semester. Next week in particular, uh, I'm happy to uh, share on Tuesday, January 25th, we'll be joined by Brown School Associate Professor Trish Cole. She'll give a talk on engaging parents to improve child behavioral health. On Wednesday, January 26, we will be joined by Executive Director of Gateway Human Trafficking, Dr. Shima Rostami. She'll be giving a talk about race and human trafficking, how racial inequality impacts human trafficking. And on Thursday, January 27, we will be joined by Professor of Practice, Susan Steeritz, for a talk on towards a sex positive approach to services for older adults. So again, thank you for being here today. We hope to see you at many other open classrooms in the coming weeks, and I will pass it back to Janet. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Now it is my honor to introduce today's speaker. Rodrigo Reyes is co-interim dean of the Brown School, as well as the chair of the urban design specialization in our Masters of Public Health program. Co-Dean Reyes' research focuses on built in community environment and public health with particular interest in community interventions for promoting physical health, as well as the effect of built environment and active transportation on physical activity and health. And he's gonna to talk to us today about people, health and place. Please join me in welcoming our friend Rodrigo. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here. Thank you, Janet, Sarah, Cynthia, all colleagues there and all the other folks there are now joining us on, uh, online. It's a pleasure to be here. I love doing this with you. It's, I think it's the second or third time, I don't remember anymore. This is a wonderful platform. It just allows us to share some of the curriculum, you know, contents that we teach here, but also some of the research that we do. So that's sort of what I'll be doing today. I'll be talking a little bit, uh, what, you know, what, how we frame this, connection between people, health, and place. This is also happening at the moment that you know, I'm working with another wonderful colleague, Professor Deborah Salvo, to start a new research unit called People, Health, and Place Research Unit that is sitting under the PRC, the Prevention Research Center umbrella. So that, that's a new research initiative that folks that work on, on that Brown at Brown will be you know, convening uh, hopefully in, in, in the immediate future. And we'll have a few projects in the pipeline and a few ideas. What I'll be doing today is just sharing how we think about those things and how those things are affecting our lives. But I will start saying that I think my work is much easier today, unfortunately, than it was three years ago. Uh, so the experience of being in this pandemic, and I mentioned this in my class yesterday to the students, really showed us and is showing us every day how the places we live affect our behaviors and our lives. I mean, the whole the whole pandemic, you know, uh, you know experience is largely, you know, 
experience it through the lens of know where we whether we have the ability to move around or not how much time we spend in our houses or homes or workplaces or commuting or not commuting or access to places so i i'm framing these as as a, the first global natural built environment experiment that we faced uh, in modern times probably uh, in all times all cities across the globe and st louis is not different uh, coped with the pandemic by you know, restraining people's movements or allowing people to go to places or not going to places by changing transit systems, by changing access to places or increasing access to places or decreasing access to places. So uh, I think now we perceive much with much more intensity how, how the surround, surrounding environment shape, is shaping our living every day. So I think Unfortunately, it makes it easier for me to, to make people relate to that. But at the same time, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to use uh, what we are learning through uh, with the pandemic on how to make our environment a better, better for all. So all the, I would say most of the health conditions that we experience in the globe are largely uh, related to living in, in communities, and especially in urban areas. The, Urbanization change, uh, it varies across the globe. The United States is not the most urbanized no country in the globe, but the majority of our population are, uh, are living in cities, somewhere between 60 to 70 percent. Parts of the globe are 90 percent urbanized, some are 50 to 60 percent urbanized, but we are all, most of us are living in what we call cities. We have different definitions for that across the globe depends on the size of the city or the administrative organization of the city, but I'll, let's call those you no know, urban settings or urban set or, uh, or urban areas. We don't have to really call them cities. It's very common for us to, to refer in the US as cities or suburban and urban areas with a different connotation. What I'm referring here is uh, people living in places that are highly urbanized. So it's not really how we define what is urban, suburban, or, or living in cities or not living in the cities uh, here in our nation. But all things that we are seeing in this uh, left side of this slide are examples of things that we experience because we live in cities, and they can actually you know, increase or decrease our health and our well-being. The whole globe has been paying attention of you know, how we can actually transform our cities to, to improve people's lives. And the United Nations has been framing this under the umbrella of the Sustainable Development Goals. And six, six of those goals and 14 targets within those goals are directly connected to urban design, transportation and health. In other words, a lot of the F, many of the efforts we are seeing the globe now are really connecting on how we can improve cities to make uh, them more inclusive and healthier. So that's what we're gonna uh, gonna talk about today and how we have, have been framing this uh, for our students in our school, the MPH students, but also across the globe and how they have been working with, uh, on these uh, definitions with colleagues across the globe as well. So the way we see this is the cities are uh, pretty much you no know, shaped by what we are calling eight Ds. So these eight Ds are you no know, things that we can change in, at the regional level or local level to affect how the cities are, uh, the design of the cities and the shape of the cities uh, are so determined. So at the regional level, we have destination, distribution, and demand components. I'll give you an, one example. Sarah just mentioned to me, if you allow me to say, Sarah, she lives, she lives, she lives across the river. But, so how many universities we have, a big university we have in St. Louis? We have a few, few of them, right? So if you live in a typical job that is connected to a university, let's say my example. No, if I lived across the river, I would probably have to commute. Uh, by dri you know, driving or taking a transit. So that's one example of how distribution of employment and employment as, uh, access and employment diversity will affect how you commute. So th this is much more at the regional level because you know, we have plants, universities, hospitals, they are not, they are unevenly distributed across the region. And this is pretty much affected by the regional level decision-making 
processes. Down to the local level, I'll give you a few examples. You know, if you open the door of, of your building now, of your house, and what you see when you open the door, you probably you see or you not see a sidewalk or a street or signs or other buildings or other houses. Those are design things that you see, how beautiful things are or how tall they are or how close they are. How close, how close is for you to walk to the next, uh, the, the first uh, bus stop you can see? How diverse in terms of land use is your building? I can tell you, if I open my, my, my door now, I only see houses. I will not see grocery stores. I will not see parking lots. I will not see pharmacies or anything like that. So it's not very diverse. I'm referring here to land use diversity. How attractive are those uh, things that I see? Do I feel that those things are beautiful or not well maintained? So as you can see, we are calling those eight Ds, things that we can change in our places, in our cities, and improve uh, uh, our well-being. And I'll show you how those things can be changed and how they're affecting our well-being. So how can we change those things? So the first, the first message here is, no, let's recognize what are the things that can be changed or what, or what what are the things that have been changed over time and are affecting my life today? So how those things are changed? So those things are largely changed by the way we structure and govern the places we live. So governance systems, they vary across the globe. They vary within uh, our country. They vary within our region. We have 90 so municipalities in, in the whole region. We have East and West you know, uh, East River uh, actions, West River actions, we have, you know, the county, the city, St. Louis is a sort of a, a plethora of, of governance systems that we have in place. So how the city and the regions and the, or the municipalities are you now implementing those things that really matter. What we learn in the places that are doing well in terms of improving cities is that good governance implies accountability, transparency, community engagement, efficiency, and participation. So I'm asking you, how much have you been engaged or have been allowed to participate in decision-making processes affecting designing elements in our city? That's a good starting point to think, well, do I live in a very well-developed governance, governance system or not? The way we, we, we were allowed to engage in the decision-making processes or how much control we have on that, that will affect how things are shaped. So that's a good starting point, I would say. So do you feel do you feel that we live in a good governance system or not? I'll leave that question for the, the chat. And well, good governance is not enough. So we, having good governance is, is it's a, I would say a, a starting point that it's a good starting point, but how things are changed at the design level or so how the design elements are changed at the regional and local level it's by shaping policies. So absence and presence of policies and the type of policies we have in those rounds that you're seeing this slide, they will affect designing elements. So redlining uh, policies early in the early 1930s or late 1920s in, in the US, and particularly in St. Louis, they have shaped dramatically how this our city it is today. The, there, there's plenty of no documentation showing the how the north-south divides in St. Louis, the Delmar divide, has been largely affected by redlining policies early in the, in the previous century. So there was an example, that's an example of a policy that shaped housing systems, transportation systems in St. Louis. So it's not only having policy, policies, but good policies. And absence of policies as well. Houston experienced a dramatic, you know, uh, an outcome from 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 uh, a hurricane a years a few years ago. Well, Houston is one of the few places in the U.S. that we don't have any regulation for zoning. So, absence of policies have an impact as well. So, it's not only having or not having policies, but the type of policies we have. So, how we shape design in cities by shaping policies. Policies are the driving forces in the in the design, designing and shaping cities. So that's how we make those changes and those changes are sustainable. Cities that are doing better now, they have better policies in place. But obviously those policies, they are not only hard to change, but they take time to, to have an effect. 
So changing policies will change design elements. So to me, that's the planning part, designing part, transportation part. So understanding those elements is from the, it's very important. And knowing that those elements are the critical elements to actually make cities better for people to live in. And why this matters? Because where we go, how we go, how we feel, with whom we interact, where we work, where we buy, where we have fun, and where we live, it's largely affected by those designing elements. So I guarantee that we all can relate to that. Where we buy groceries, where's your pharmacy, where's your doctor, where you have fun with your kids or your family, when you spend time with loved one, your loved ones, where we find jobs for the type of work you do. It's easy for you to walk or to bike. It's easy for you to drive or not. It's safe or it's not safe. You feel that you belong to the community you live now. You feel they're excluded in that community now. All those things that we experience in our days, in our daily living, are shaped by the way cities are designed. So why we need good policies in place? To design cities that are more inclusive, are more sustainable, and allow people to have you know, better uh, ch choices for their behaviors and their, and their daily living conditions. So what I advocate here is not to force people to do things, but actually allow people to choose what they want to do by design, if you live in a place where you don't have sidewalks, what are the options you have to walk in a safe route since you don't have a route that is accessible or is safe? So if you don't have sidewalks, there's no point in you advocating for me to ask, ask you to maybe you can walk more. There's no point for me to ask you to take risks of walking on the street that, is not, that, has, that has no sidewalks. So designing things is important to allow people to have choices and healthy choices. So I think we're on the same page here. Moving on, those choices that we have, behaviors, the way we live, how we live, with who we do things and how we do things will affect, have an, an enormous impact in our health. So traffic accidents, exposure to air pollution, how, how loud is the place we live? That's those things you know, will affect your sense of social isolation, safety, how active you are, how much time you spend sitting, the type of food you eat, those, those you know, risk exposures, they will affect you know, number of car accidents, you know, uh, uh, cardio, cardio respiratory diseases, you know, respiratory diseases, cancer, obesity, infectious diseases, as you see in COVID now. So the long-term and the immediate term impacts and the health outcomes, there could be rapidly and I would say, change in a sustainable manner if we could improve cities in places we live. So that's my spiel on why designing cities and why cities that have been more successful, they experience populations they have a, they are more, you no know, you know, probably you no know, living in better condition. I don't have the capacity to read in the chats now, but I will promise to address questions down the road, okay? Uh, we'll pause in a second to address a few questions, but let me finish this first part. So think, I'm, I'm not pretending to convince you. I'm just trying to show you why I think this is important. So how we, we what's the starting point? So the starting point is really measuring things that we think are important. You know, this is a map of Melbourne. You no, know, that uses walkability to really reshape zoning in Melbourne. So this is St. Louis. Uh, this is the National Walkability Index from EPA. Uh, well, the darker the green there, color, the more walkable is the region. This is the census block level data. The darker the orange, orange color uh, you see, the less walkable is the area. So anyway, we have indicators that are you know, available here and there. I would say that largely those indicators, they are really around you know, features of the built environment, but they are not connected to built environment, to social environment elements. So I think we have a long way to improving indicators. Uh, to provide better assessments and starting points to start the conversation. But you see, downtown St. Louis is you know, more walkable by considering all the built environment elements. So I'm saying more walkable with quote, quote, because, because it has the potential to be walkable. That doesn't mean that people walk more there or that they feel safe walking there or that they feel they have places that they want to go if they, they walk there. So I'm not saying that people are walking more there. I'm just saying they have the physical features or the built environment elements that would make them 
it probably e easier to walk if you want to walk. And as you can see, in northern St. Louis is sli slightly less walkable than southern St. Louis. The further you go to west, the less walkable it is. The further you go uh, to east, uh, the more walkable it is. That's pretty much follows the shape of the colonial times, <laughs> I would say, and, and the early colonization of St. Louis, when the older part of St. Louis tends to be more walkable than the newer parts, because that's the way the cities were shaped early on, it's following the French style and of urbanization and especially after the world war ii when we followed the modern style of you no know, of, of 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 planning where we prioritize cars and not you know walking or smaller blocks or more more density we, we became less and less prone to be to have walkable cities so that's the where that's where we are today in st louis as you can see we could do much better so what I'm saying we should do, we should have better policies and legislation, allowing places to be more walkable and, and more friendly for people to, to do things. Uh, I think we have, to, we have to improve public transportation. We we'll need to seriously invest in those things and assess how those things are impacting us. But wait, we are not done. I have another thing to, to share, Janet. So, okay, Rodrigo is saying you have to do that. And if you make cities more compact, people can walk more and bike more and have more places to go, that's what we need to do. Okay, how can we prove that? So everybody has to have been, have been hearing about clinical trials now because of COVID. How we test vaccines, we do randomized clinical trials, we test what is effective, what is not effective, how it does it work, how does it affect population? Well, that's not how we do things uh, with cities. I'm asking you, can we randomize neighborhoods in St. Louis and experiment? Can we randomize cities in the US and experiment and assess what's the impact in five years time? No, we can't do that. As much as we can't randomize planets, it test climate change. If, well, what's the best science to prove that climate change is real is randomizing planets? What's the best science to prove that designing better cities is good for health is randomizing cities and testing populations? So obviously it's not possible for not only for ethical reasons, for practical reasons, we can't do that. So what we do is easily we analyze historical data or we uh, test ideas by uh, building statistical models or modeling data to see what the data is going to look in the, in the in the future, or also testing natural experiments, cities that adapted things and we assess things that were changed or policies that are implemented. So those, those are roughly speaking the three ways you can test those ideas that I mentioned here: natural experiments, modeling, or historical data, retrospective data. I'm sure my colleague Kim Johnson, who is watching here, she's having ideas already. She's an happy person. And I hope I'm not saying something wrong because she is too smart for me here to say anything about biostats. So, okay, let's see how those things will be impacting cities. So, what we did, we tested this idea. Okay, let's let's make cities more compact. Let's adopt those principles that we have been advocating and test those ideas using these no sustainable development goals. So what happens if we change land use? We change transportation. Will this impact risk exposure and health? So we collected data from Melbourne, Boston, London, Delhi, Sao Paulo, and Copenhagen. You see those are cities in different countries, in different you know, high and low middle income countries, but also cities that are very different in terms of transportation modes. You see Melbourne and Boston, high income countries and cities in high income countries, more car oriented, London and Copenhagen, high income countries, more mixed type of transportation. Sao Paulo and Delhi, Brazil and India, uh, low and middle income countries and more mixed and less dependent of car with cars, so using more public transit. So you can see examples of those cities across the US. Although in US we are predominantly dependent of cars, if the mix varies a little bit. Okay, so those are the impacts we see on cardio, cardio cardiovascular diseases, type two diabetes, respiratory disease, and road trauma in Dallas. The number of years people live with health or, or the number of years they are losing in terms of health due to those diseases. And those are the number of years that people are affected by, by you know, air pollution, traffic accidents, physical inactivity and an obesity. 
largely those are the behaviors that affected, they are changed, they are affected, directly affected by shaping cities. Those behaviors will have impacts in those diseases. So those are the diseases that are most impacted by those four factors that I mentioned before. So we collected data uh, on health data on those cities. And we asked the question, what if we increase compact, compactivity in cities? We make cities 30% more compact. And we, we make them denser, more diverse. And we ask people to use more public transportation. We increase public transportation usage. And we increase the number of people that are walking and not driving. So we, are, we model that hypothesis that cities are more compact. People are using more public transit walking more and driving less. So we, we changed those transportation modes and design elements to see the risk exposure. Here's the outcome. So if you see a positive number, this is a positive impact. If you see a negative number, this is a ne negative impact. Positive means you are adding more quality of life or adding more years living with health. Negative means we are losing quality of life or losing years living with health. So as you can see, across the board, we have positive impacts on cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes for all countries. Those impacts vary because populations are slightly different, health conditions are different, health systems are different, but largely positive impacts, right? Not so much for respiratory diseases because, again, population, the population the distribution is slightly different, conditions are slightly different, but... I would say it's very positive for health, but negative for road trauma. That means we have more people losing quality of life or dying because we ask them to walk more in denser cities. And so you probably are thinking, hey, Rodrigo, that's a terrible idea. Uh, I'll have more people benefiting from cardiovascular diseases, but I'll have people dying because of you know, they are being hit on the streets. Well, that's true. If we today ask people to, everybody in St. Louis to walk on the streets, uh, starting tomorrow, without shaping people's behavior, without making streets safer, without adding side, uh, more sidewalks and implementing regulations for driving and, and making driving safer, we will have more people affected. So it's not enough change behaviors. We have to improve infrastructure for walking and biking. So good infrastructure is essential to make those changes. So we need better policies, better infrastructure, if you want to make those changes to be effective. So Janet, that's my initial spiel. I will think I'll pause for questions now. Great, so mostly what we've had in chat so far um, are some, some comments, uh, some, some compliments on the beautiful visuals that you're using in your slides and how helpful that is for visual learners, um, as well as just a viewer, expressing concern that people's ultimate health outcomes are so affected. Um, so it, kind of up to you, we can give people a second to post some questions or if there's more content that you wanna to get to, we can keep on rolling and save the Q&A for the end. Yeah, I can share a little more. Let's see if we have any questions. Let's put my, my readers on, otherwise I can't see anything. <laughs> Oh yeah, so Danielle, it's not enough to only, okay, that's a good, uh, thank you for allowing me to clarify that. What I, I was meant to say was this, was, it's not enough to, to only make cities more compact or more efficient on that sense. Okay, let's say we increase land use in St. Louis. I, I live in a new city, okay? Let's assume, okay, I have more places I can walk to. Okay, I have pharmacies in a walking distance, groceries, no, I can look like I can walk to my job because it's close to campus. So let's say land use is better here. Okay. So technically I can walk more. But if safety is not measures are not implemented on the streets, I will have higher risk to be hit when I walk to work or walk to groceries. So it's not enough to only improve design elements. We have to improve other features, such as improving sidewalks, improving safety in traffic and or safety from crime and other things uh, related to the exposure out there. So uh, I hope I have clarified that, Emily. Uh, sorry, Danielle. I just saw Emily question popping up. Which one of these design policies? Oh, oh, Emily, I don't see there's one. It's, you know, it's not one thing. You don't get to pick one thing. You know, it's just like eating healthy. You can pick only bananas. 
That's why I have a fruit salad. You know, we have to pick all things together. So you can't pick only density and not changing other things. You have to do all at once. That's why it's so tricky. That's why it's so tricky to do those things. You know, it's easy for, okay, let's only improve sidewalks. So I'll give you this example. Okay, let's make the sidewalks wider, safer, more. The lights are better, everything is better, but I don't have any place to walk to. So it doesn't matter if the sidewalks are good. If I do not, there's no reason for me to walk there. Right, so I have to I have to see. I see this as no all at once, but the good thing is this: it's much easier to sell that with a more with more options of the impacts. You no, know, for policymakers, you no know, business owners and homeowners and other folks. If you only pick one thing, so having all this no this no more I would say more ample you know uh, approach I think it's much better because you have other talking points to uh, bring on board you no know, stakeholders that are being impacted for those things uh, let me see what I see there uh, thank you so much for the why do you see the three words from single institution bank influencers uh, equity well that, that's Excellent question. That's, I think that's, I would say if I had a one perfect answer for that, I would probably would be starting a consulting company and doing a lot of, you know, you no know, aggressive actions there. But I think I have a few, a few ideas that what may, might be working. I think after, you no, know, I've been living here for six years and I have been doing this work for 26 years on built environment. I have visited cities in many places. I have worked in many places in the globe and 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 being a, a citizen here and and this is my home in St. Louis. What I think we need is it's it's not too complicated to explain. It's hard to implement. We need more diverse land use, with better job and opportunities and leisure opportunities and health uh, access opportunities to all. So I think land use is quite important. Why is it so hard to, to change land uses here? Because you know land ownership Especially in the United States, land ownership is very much on the deregulated in a sense compared to other places. So it's much harder for us to engage people in, the, in, the, in bringing people on board than in other places. I'll give you one good example. If you see nations where democracy has a different you know, uh, concept, right? Where it's much more centralized you see rapid implementation on city changes. Is that good or bad? This is not necessarily good because those changes are implemented at expenses of people's lives or decision and engagement. So I'm not advocating that it should be having a top-down approach. I think we need a more comprehensive approach that we will bring both community and business owners together in St. Louis to advocate for those changes. We, this, I'm not talking something new here. We all know that has been the challenge for us in, 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 uh, in St. Louis history. The other thing that I think it's important is tackling the vacancy uh, component in St. Louis. Vacancy became a huge problem. So can't we use vacancy as an opportunity to intervene and create opportunities for you know, food insecurity improvements, leisure access improvements, and community you no know, living experiences. Maybe we have to be a little more aggressive in, the, in using vacancy as, a, as an opportunity as well. Danielle, I'm not sure I gave a good answer, Ashley, but we can continue this conversation at some point. Uh, to what extent is politics or political difference? Oh, mm. I think that, well, I think politics has everything to do with that. So the way I frame this is using the kingdoms model, uh, stream, policy streams, uh, policy streams model to explain that. I'll give you I'll give you examples from places where things work together. So according to their thinking, you know, we have policy, politics, and we have uh, uh, largely a window of opportunity when we have the right policy. We have, which is the, the right solution. And politics are coordinated. And the moment and support is built up. So one example that has, uh, has been largely used across the globe is Bogota in Colombia. Bogota 
middle income country, you know, one of the most in uh, one of the countries with the, with the most uh, uh, inequity, you know, community inequity levels across the globe. Uh, today is recognized as was a city that had implemented large and sustainable changes in biking and biking infrastructure. So how that happened? So that happened in the 80s and early 90s, late 80s, when one mayor was a champion for that. And so that is an opportunity. They had a community advocacy uh, group in place that was advocating for action. And it had enough evidence showing that biking net and improving bike infrastructure was good for, for the city. The, the, the mayor pushed through that thing. He had a major pushback from business owners saying that this is not profitable, this is not good, this is affecting business. So what happened over time, the more they pushed that through, the more business owners were making money because they were seeing people biking through their stores and stopping by their stores and buying more things. So, so it was hard to, to, to have the right political and politics, no momentum. So when we have a champion and politics are addressed that way, we have the right solution, things can be changed. So politics has everything to do. It doesn't matter if we have the best solution, if politics is not in place. Look at COVID, we see what is happening now. We have the solutions, we know what works, we know what should be done, we have resources in the nation and politics is preventing us to push through. So politics has everything to do with that. And especially in cities where that's the real politics, right? We talk about federal level politics, but we as citizens, we live the real politics is you know, when, I, when I, I have to ride a bus, when I have to drive my car, when I have to go to the park. That's what is really impacting all the, the politics that are impacting my daily living, uh, I think, in my experience. Uh, Emily, yeah. So what do we do about the political barrier? Well, uh, I think we have to work together with a few things. First, do we have the solutions? Do we have policies that work? Do we have examples of policies that worked in cities that are similar to ours? Have other, other you know, constituents been effective doing that? So building stories in the storytelling parts that is convincing to stakeholders, I think it's important. So when I talk about evidence, you know, it's not only the scientific evidence, so we have enough scientific evidence, but we have sort of more compelling evidence that is the storytelling parts that helps us to communicate well. A third thing, identifying who are the champions. Do have legislators or people in the, poli the, in the policy arena, they are champions for that. Though, those are the, probably the champions who should be in the rallying behind us. Uh, we should be riding behind to push through. What are the stakeholders that are in our city? What are the community organizations, business owners that can support us? So I think it's building this alliance is a good starting point. And you have to be patient and, and keep carrying on because things can happen. It's, I'm not saying that it's a perfect solution. It may, it might not happen, uh, be happening in the short term, but if we have all those elements together, when the opportunity arises, and that's why the, the, the you know, policy streams theory says, you know, when the window of opportunity arises, that's when we have to move on. Lived experience is so valuable. Yeah, Daniel, I totally agree with you. Mm. Emily is putting some tough questions on me. Uh, she's really make me work my, my mind really hard here to, to provide some, you know, uh, uh, I would say, you know, possible answers here. But I really appreciate those, those questions. It's been a good dialogue between the two of you, for sure. <laughs> so um, a, a question I have. Uh, you know, listening to you speak, and I, I don't have any expertise in, in this topic, uh, but as, as I think, as, as I would have thought about city planning, to me, sort of new development versus how we change existing development seems like a, kind of a, a totally different lenses. And, and as somebody who really studies this, I'm curious um, for examples or, or um, thoughts on, on things you admire. Um, new development anywhere in the world that is intentionally and multifacetedly designed to incorporate these things, like who's doing it really well? And then with existing, it sure seems like incremental approaches over time is what makes change. You just mentioned Bogota and biking, but any other um, examples of 
changes to existing cities where policies over time really you know, change the reality to people on the ground? Uh, that's a very good question, and I um, appreciate you asking that. Of course, I think something that I haven't had the chance to, to, to frame well is, you know, we can retrofit cities unless you live in a, in a place where actually those things are happening, because there are, there are countries that go with the retrofit things. They just you know, they just we start over again, right? So for largely, for most of us across the globe, especially for us in the US, we can't just retrofit places. So what we have to do is implement changes. They will be, have slow but steady you know, impacts. And over time, we'll see those things happening. So some cities are doing that, and uh, they are doing that you know, really well. I'll just mention Bogota as one example. So what, what is happening interesting now, I'll give you an example in Europe and then in the US. You know, Paris is implementing a policy that for all zoning in the next 10 years uh, is being changed uh, to allow uh, uh, people living in the city to reach anything they want to reach in 15 minutes walking distance. It's called the concept of 15 minute city. So you can reach whatever you need in your living in 15 minutes walking distance. So that's one of the examples I can, uh, can give you. The other good example is you now Barcelona has implemented what they call the super blocks, where there's no blocks, in the, 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 this block where people live, you have all those things in those blocks, you no know, groceries, pharmacies, so land use has, has been sort of you know, largely you know, changed. Here in the US, you know, do we have sparse sparse examples of local of, 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 of things that are, are being implemented. I'll give, you, I'll give you iconic examples. Not very good for, for, for most of US, but iconic examples, they are, they are, they are good for benchmarking sometimes. No, uh, High Line in New York. It's a good example of reclaiming an abandoned part of a structure in the city to make it more not only more walkable, but an attraction to the city. So, it, so we have examples of cities that are thriving in doing those things and doing more or less well. It's not always perfect. It takes time. It takes time to show results. Uh, and I think the you know, economic results, they actually come faster than even the health outcome results sometimes. You no, know? I think the tricky part is, especially for us in St. Louis, we don't experience that you know, as pronounced in other cities, is gentrifying places. We can, can't make those changes at the expense of moving people, displacing people, and, make it this, and making cities better for people that can afford to live in them. So I think that's the tricky part, especially for us in the US, when you see you know, cities improving and doing well, that then we displace people, we attract younger and la less diverse populations. And the, because the places are, those, 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 those places are becoming more expensive to live in. So what I think we need to do is just advocating for making cities diverse and better for all, and, and avoiding, you know, making cities, the skewed cities to be better for some people in the city. Hi, well, Rico, this is fascinating. And my question to you is, I hope I'm framing well, is as, as urban areas are becoming more violent and, 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 and have safety concerns, what changes in urban planning can we expect or is on the horizon? I mean, we can expect or we should expect. We should expect. <laughs> I don't think we can expect much changes because urban planning, my experience has been uh, less than positive with, with, with that uh, recently, especially in our region and across the nation because urban planning is largely de deregulated and decentralized. So I think we should expect more, a, a, a more, I think we should advocate for a more aggressive framing for urban planning. I don't think that will ever happen because the way we operate in our country is very deregulated and very decentralized. So I think I know some, some overall guidelines for planning cities will be important. I'll give you an example in Brazil that is a developing country, highly urban, much more urban than the US, is 85% urbanized, and we are 65 or so percent urban. urban. So Brazil has a, a framework, a national policy that is called the cities, the cities, uh, cities statute. It's a free translation, uh, but 
It requires all cities with more than 70,000 people, and the, the, these are 80% of the cities in Brazil, to have a city plan implemented in, in, in five years time. And that happened, that, that deadline expired. So they had all, all cities, they had to develop city plans. So having a framework is a starting point. Is that enough? No, it's not enough. So what happened in Brazil? Cities that were more advanced and had better infrastructure and better planning departments, they developed better planning, better plans, city plans for, for, for their citizens. Cities that were less developed, they ended up hiring companies. They were basically you no know, just boxing those plans. They were re reselling those plans. Oh, this is like a toolbox, just just implement the toolbox. And the plans are com complying to the law. They're obeying, no buying to the law, but they are not effective. So, so having a framework is important that will allow us, allow us to have some level of standardization or minimum standard for all cities. I think that's important, but having a local engagement, community buying to make those frameworks meaningful for citizens and not only for business, not only for no parts of the city, to me, that will be the, the things that we should be doing. So urban planning needs to be more advocacy centered, more citizen centered and less business centered. I probably will be hit by that, but that's my, that's, that's the way I see that. It has to be centered around citizens needs, not only about you no know, business owners needs. And as a follow-up question, that's a, a great uh, opportunity for this question. Then how is community voice incorporated in urban planning? What's the structure and the framework for obtaining community voice? Well, we uh, that's wonderful. I think it's really, you know, I think that, again, it really depends on the governance system in each city. Some cities are doing better than others. Some cities have channels and pipelines where citizens have a say in an all decision process for the planning. So actually having those, those channels where we can exercise our voices that's that's how we should be uh, doing things, you know. When if we don't have those channels, we have to ad advocate for them. It, to me, it's not enough to just know. Okay, we have a, a new bill in the next election. We're going to vote for that bill, and then you show up to vote without being educated about that. So, I think what works well for us in the U.S. is that advocacy, you know, groups. They are centered around that. You know, when you talk about planning, it seems less less tangible, Cynthia, but I'm talking about transit. I'm talking about parks and rec. I'm talking about housing. Those are all things that are largely related to planning, right? So so maybe you don't have, oh, this is a planning meeting. No, this is a parks meeting, but parks, you know, it's related to planning, <laughs> right? And transit and so on. So I think that's how I see that. I think Kim has a question. How much people who are designing the metaverse? I have no idea, Kim. I'm too neophytes on metaverse conversations. And I'm still, I'm still, I will be honestly, as far as generational conversation, I'm, I'm still quite shocked that we are talking about a metaverse when we are still not even, we haven't even found a way to live you know, in the real, in the real verse. <laughs> So, uh, but I, I'm really now fighting that conversation came out. I, I, I will not pretend I have a good, uh, or I have a, any answer to that question at all. Enrico, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, is there, what is gender sensitive urban design and is it incorporated uh, generically in planning? Well, that's, I think, that's a wonderful question. I actually had a conversation with my students in class last semester. And no, this is this is not a new concept, but it's a fairly new, it's a fairly new conversation. So it's not that it's a new concept that this gender no, center no design is important, but it's only in the last few years has been or largely been uh, you know part of the conversation. I don't think I think it's 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 becoming more and more a trend in part of the conversation. I don't think it's you know, really uh, at the core of the conversations. So obviously, what the way we design things, they will they will they should be centered around uh, you no know, gender inequities. The simplest example is just you no know, gender inclusive you no know, restaurant restaurants. Now, right, we have those examples. That's a simple a simple one, an easy one because the buildings they will allow people to to uh, have their identities you no know, represented. That's the easiest part to, to show. 
right? But at the city level, the way we design transit is not really centered around women. Well, I'll give you examples. How safe women feel when they ride the transit, right? So have we asked what women need when they need to ride the transit? No, they, do they feel the visibility is important? So we found in, in, in service, for instance, that it's very important to, 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 to perceive that as visible that people are seeing you when you're waiting the transit to come, that you're not totally protected. Because if you're being seen, you probably feel safer than not being seen. So just giving an example that we have metrics and examples to do that. And uh, I read this book that is called Invisible Women. It has a wonderful chapter about gender inclusive, gender inclusion through design and how, how much uh, we uh, we have to improve our conversation on that on that topic. So I appreciate the question, and there's more we can talk about that at some point. Uh, oh, wonderful! Thank you, Jennifer. And please feel free to send me a note if you want to send me an email on that. There's King Johnson in planning of the metaverse. So Rodrigo, I, I was curious to ask you to expand. You, you a few minutes ago were talking about how very often the meeting isn't called a planning meeting per se, but it's an element of planning. And um, you know, sort of to take you to the beginning of the presentation, you were talking about the importance of belonging in and participating in the place where you are. Um, I would love to ask you to spell that out a little bit more, understanding that mechanisms of city government or county government, et cetera, um, coalitions are gonna be different somewhat no matter where you are. But if somebody is passionate about these topics and they're looking for how to, how to engage and be heard in one small part that becomes the whole, what types of activities should they be looking to engage in? I think that's a wonderful question, a tricky one as well. I think, as you, as you mentioned before, cities are not the same, the governance in cities varies a lot, right? So we, we, we can't expect the same departments that are operating in St. Louis or the departments will be operating you know, in Columbia, Missouri. So I think the way I, the way I usually uh, see that and what, and actually we put that in paper a few years ago, uh, is you know, recognizing what are the systems in place. So let's talk first about the systems, not departments, not, no uh, city level departments or organizations. So just start from the systems uh, perspective. Transportation, housing, parks and rec, healthcare. So just those are the systems. So the first question we ask, so what are, what are the, how is the transportation or transit and transportation uh, organizing my city? So what are the departments? What are the key organizations? Is there a, a specific department? Some cities, they don't have a specific department. Some cities, they have biking designated departments and pedestrians designated departments and transit, is, it's very, very comprehensive. Some cities, they have one department with everybody. So that's the first starting point. So how this, the governance is actually organized on those systems? So that's the first question. The second question, what are the key actors in that system in the city that are outside the government? So in St. Louis, what are the key actors and the key organizations operating on that? The third question is, what are the policies already in place? So if you, I think it's a good starting point, you know, think about, think yourself, no, okay, what's the governance here? Transportation, what, how, how transportation is organized at the city level, Govern, I'm talking about government. What are the policies in place? What are the key actors outside the government? So I think it, to me, it's almost like mapping first where we are and then starting to build, you know, building blocks. Okay, where I can operate? Is there a space that it, you know, is happening? There's a conversation happening. So we can feel very overwhelmed. I, I realize what I'm saying here, it requires a lot of energy and intention unless we're very passionate about. So that's why I'm saying, you know, uh, I'm answering that the other way to you because you, know, you asked me if somebody's passionate about that, somebody wants to do something, to me, that's the starting point. However, let's change the conversation to people that are, no, this is not necessarily my passion, but I care about that. No, it's not my, my priority in my life, 
but you know, I care about the, the way I walk, the way I commute. That's, the, that's where things are more complicated because how can we educate you know, population to understand this is, this is really important. This is part of the daily living. I don't have a good answer for that part yet. I think that's, that's why I think where, that's when advocacy I think becomes more and more important. Rigo, I had one question. I'm going to switch to this one. You mentioned the super block in, uh, I believe, it was in Barcelona. I believe. Right. Yeah. Okay. Would you? Can you tell me what are the benefits or what are the and the challenges that have emerged around that particular urban design? I think I can't speak much about the challenges. I think I can. I can uh, that are documented. I can tell you more about what we have experienced, but. Let me reframe that example to address your question with a different perspective, Cynthia. Mm -hmm. Designing places needs to reflect the culture and the traditions of, 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 of the cities and the communities, right? In Brazil, there's famous examples and probably you have seen pictures of Rio de Janeiro and people live on the hills where you no know, in the slums, so I don't like to word the word, we don't use the word slums in Brazil anymore, we use communities now. So I'm using slums just to, to provide the context. Uh, so some people call shanty towns, which I don't like it too. You see those communities in the hills where you no, know, it's famous by the pictures you see there. So so some of the initiatives that were implemented was you no, know, okay, let's find a place where people can live better. We find land, usually where you find land is you no know, far from downtown, far from the city because land is cheaper, right? So government would buy land, build houses, all looking the same, all looking alike, with you no know, be probably better looking houses, with better materials and streets and so on. They would relocate people from that from those you know, communities to those new communities. So what happened over time? A lot of people would sell those places, new houses, in the in the uh, under the table because they can't really sell that's government property. They would just make contracts and go back to the communities they lived before. So why? Because if you lose the community participation, community element, community community building process, and the belonging to the place. We will lose the sight of that. So super blocks work in Barcelona because people they like communal living. They like to eat together. They like to be around people. Families live together. You no, know, usually like in many places in the in, in Latin America and in Europe. You know, if you get older, you're living with your family. You don't live, you don't leave the house of the family, right? Or you live to the next door. So what I'm saying, Cynthia, and I'm not sure the blocks super blocks will work in US. Unless we represent the traditions and the cultures and the and the, and the aspirations of our communities, so we can't import designs in places from places and adapt here unless we incorporate cultural elements and cultural traditions. To me, the example I gave you from Brazil, it's a good example that you know it's not only building places that are, they look nicer and they are potentially better looking in better, physically speaking, better places, if you, don't, if you don't feel that you belong there. So place making is important. So the blocks are important and they work well because they represent the culture in Barcelona. Do they work in the US? I'm not quite sure, right? So I sort of know, had a, a long answer for your question, Cynthia, but I think I just wanted to clarify that I'm not advocating for importing examples merely. I think we have to learn from those examples and see how we can make adapt them to what we need here. Thank you, Rodrigo. Turn over to you, Janet. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. We are at time, and I feel like we've just scratched the surface, but also that we've learned so much from you. Thank you so much, Rodrigo, for spending this time with us. Uh, before we do close the webinar, is there any sort of final thought you want to uh, send us out with? Any any call to action or words for prospective students in the audience? Uh, I will give you, I'll tell something that I say to my students, uh, uh, sort of very short story. You no, know, when when I went to, to college in Brazil, in Brazil, we, we had to do a test to enter college, right? Four days. We have all subjects. The last day is an essay. 
So they, they just choose a topic 30 minutes before the essay. You have to write an essay about the topic. So my essay in the topic when I entered college was a question, city living is you no know, good living or goofy living? <laughs> it's a free translation. So I think city living is good living if you, can, if you can't you know, improve the way we live in cities. So I, I, uh, I think cities make societies better, but we can do better at living in cities. And that's my message to all. So city living is good living, it's not goofy living. It's a good and hopeful way of sending us out. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Thank you to our audience for wonderful questions and to my co-host, Cynthia. Um, always such a pleasure to spend time with you all and so much coming up this semester on Open Classroom. So we will hope to see you guys back very soon. In the meantime, please stay healthy and safe out there, everyone. And we'll see you soon. Bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Stay warm.